you're at home and watching online, welcome. Five days till Christmas, and how many men in the room are like me and you have no idea what to get your wife for Christmas? All right, we got a couple um, honest men in the room. Uh, I have no idea what to get her. I mean, what do you honestly just, what do you get a woman who has everything? I mean, let's just be truthful in that. I'm just totally teasing, and that wasn't, didn't work well in the 8 o'clock. It didn't work here in the 9.30. I'm going to scratch that joke for the the 11 o'clock, Pastor Jeff. Help remind me. Well, I believe that Christmas is the greatest holiday season. How many are with me on that, right? If we didn't have Christmas, we wouldn't have Easter. If Jesus never came, he could never die on the cross and forgive us of our sins. Plus, what other holiday do you get to listen to specific holiday music for like three or four months of the year, right? We're not listening to America the Beautiful in May. You know, we're, we get to listen to Christmas music. How many are like me and like October rolls around, even September, Christmas music comes on, right? I have no problem with it. How many have the last name Grinch and it's like Thanksgiving has to come before Christmas music. It's like you have to have it. Wow, we got a lot of Grinches in the, the, the room. You know why I take zero issue with playing Christmas music early? Because it's the most wonderful time of the year with the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer. I'm not going to try to hit that top note. (laughs) Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Last week, Pastor Zach uh, kicked off a message, Jesus in the Neighborhood, and uh, it's off of the verse in John chapter 1, verse 14 in the message translation. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. See, Jesus left his place to come to our place so that we could live a life that is full and abundant, and then eventually we would be able to join him again at his place in heaven for eternity. And last week, Zach shared how when Jesus was born, it was very different than what Mary and Joseph may have expected. And uh, how when God enters our neighborhood, things often turn out differently than we might expect. You know, Mary and Joseph had their plans and all of a sudden a virgin is pregnant. Born in a manger, a king in a manger. A peaceful king at that. And and, uh, if you missed last week's message or part one of this series, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it. It It's a really encouraging word. And this week, I'm going to spend some time talking about what our response should look like now that Jesus has moved into our neighborhood, now that Jesus has moved into our life. And I'm going to give you the main point right off the bat so it's easy to remember and we can keep it short and you guys can get home. But the main point is this, the appropriate response to Jesus entering your neighborhood is introducing Jesus to your neighbors. That is the only appropriate response to when Jesus enters your life is to introduce other people to Jesus. And I don't see how you couldn't tell people about Jesus after what you've experienced and after experiencing and encountering his presence and his goodness. But I think we do a really bad job at remembering. I think we struggle to take inventory of all the blessings and all the good things that God has done for us. I'm talking about a joy that is unspeakable that won't go away. I'm talking about a peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm talking about strength when we are weak. I'm talking about wisdom when we lack. I'm talking about a freedom from guilt and shame and strength when we're weak and comfort in times of sorrows, when we take inventory of those blessings, how could we not introduce people to the person of those blessings? It doesn't make sense. We're going to read the account of when John the Baptist first met Jesus and encountered his presence. But before we read, I want to talk a little bit about who John the Baptist was. You're thinking, this is Christmas time. Why are we talking about John the Baptist? We'll see right here. The first 25 verses of Luke chapter 1 give uh, the account of, of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, Zechariah was a priest, and Elizabeth was his wife, and at this point, they are up in age. They're past the point of children, and they had prayed many years, God, give us children, and Elizabeth was barren. And, and Zechariah enters into the temple, and he's preventing uh, these um, sacrifices before God, and, and the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah and says, you are going to have a son, and you are going to name him John. And in verse 
verses 14 through 17, the angel said this, he will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So after John the Baptist was born, his father, Zechariah, sings this song in verses 67 through 80 in Luke chapter 1. And you'd think that this song would be all about his newborn son, John, right? But actually this song that he sings, and you can look at that yourselves, is more about Jesus and what John's role in Jesus' ministry would look like. And in verse 76, Zechariah sings this of his son, John. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. So it's important to realize that both the angel Gabriel and his father, Zechariah, recognized John's role as being a witness to Jesus Christ. And before John was even conceived, his purpose in life was to point others to Christ. Now I want to stop a moment and challenge you because you, in the same way that John the Baptist's life was meant and, and predestined to point other people to Christ, you carry that same responsibility. You were created to point others to Christ. Now, you might never get up in the pulpit and stand and speak to 50 or 100 or 1,000 people, but you are called to be light. You are called to point others to Christ. And, and, and I think that maybe one of the reasons why the world struggles so much with discontentment, especially Christians with discontentment, is because maybe we're not being obedient in pointing others to Christ. See, there is nothing more rewarding and joyful than when you share Christ with someone else. How many know the feeling? It's, it's one of the most incredible feelings in the world. Now, I don't want this to be all about feelings because life is not all about feelings. But why does it feel so good to share Christ with someone? Why does it feel so good to be a part of God's uh, kingdom and, and the, the plan that he has for your life? Why does it feel so good? Because you are operating the way that God intended you to operate. You are, you are now walking in the way that God wants you to walk, and, and there's fulfillment in that. See, John recognized and accepted the role that God wanted him to play, and because of it, many people came to know and recognize Jesus as Lord. I'll ask you this this morning, New Hope, those watching online, have you accepted the role that God wants you to play in part of bringing in the kingdom of God? Have you accepted the role of pointing others to Christ? And are many people, because of the way that you live your life, are they coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord? That's a challenging question. That's a difficult question to ask because I think many of us here today, if we're being real honest and we allow the Spirit of God to speak to us, would maybe fall under some form of conviction. Now, conviction is not a bad thing. Conviction is something that, that takes and God uses in our life and he makes us more like Christ. Without conviction, how can we know that we have fallen short? Without conviction, how can we know where, where we need to improve, right? So I'm not trying to bash anybody over the head this morning because I've bashed myself over the head plenty of times this week with this text. But when are we as a church going to rise to the occasion of the role that God has placed in advance for us to do? When are we going to start really pointing others to Christ? When are we going to really start being a witness to what Jesus has done and for him and allowing God to work through us to advance his kingdom? Back to the text, verses 26 through 38 in chapter 1 give a recount of when the same angel Gabriel went to visit Mary and says, you know, you're going to have uh, a son as well, but this son will be conceived by the Spirit of God, and, and he would be the Messiah. And after receiving this news, Mary decides to go visit her cousin Elizabeth in the hill country. And, and remember, at this point, Elizabeth is about six months pregnant, and Mary has just found out that she's pregnant. She might be like a week or maybe even a couple days after receiving this news, she goes straight to Elizabeth. This is where our text is. I'm going to ask you guys to stand up because it's warm in here. If you're at home, get off the couch, get off the bed, get up, stand up with us, be a part of our church, mass service, stand up. We're going to read the word of God. 
At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greetings reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. God, this morning, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would communicate what you want to communicate through me and speak individually to everyone here, everyone watching. Continue to to work in our lives and allow us, God, to hear your voice this morning and to respond to it, Lord. Fill us with your spirit so that we might understand. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. You may find your seat. So let's dive in. Now remember that John's main purpose prophesied over his life was to prepare the way for the Messiah. He's going ahead of Jesus to make way for Jesus. And now I find it amazing that before John was even born, he starts fulfilling that purpose. As soon as Jesus enters into Zechariah's house, and, and, and he's in utero. Keep in mind, Jesus is in utero. He's a week old. He, he might be the size of a poppy seed. Jesus enters, poppy seed Jesus enters into Zechariah's house. And, and John starts to freak out. He starts to kick. He starts to punch. He starts to alert Elizabeth. He's like, wow, I'm here. There's something has changed. And Elizabeth quickened and alerted and aware now that John is saying, hey, there's someone here. This is important. Elizabeth quickened by the Spirit. She proclaims Jesus as Lord. She, she says, how am I so favored that the mother of my Lord comes in to hear and visit me? Now, if we were to look at the rest of John the Baptist's life, we would see him calling people to repentance and baptizing in water. But all of his ministry was preparing the way for someone greater than himself. When people would start to look to him and say, are you the Messiah? Are you a great prophet? Are you the teacher? Are you this? Are you that? He would always redirect their attention back to the Lord. He would say, no, but I'm preparing a way for someone. I'm preparing the way for the Messiah. When Jesus went to be baptized by John, he says, John exclaimed, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was not just declaring Jesus as Lord by his actions and saying, hey, someone important came, I'm swimming around, I'm dancing, but now he's not just uh, proclaiming by actions and baptizing, now he's, he's speaking with his words. Now when reading this text, I was convicted in my heart Here, a a little baby in a woman's stomach is able to respond to the presence of Jesus, which led to an individual recognizing Jesus as Lord. Yet I struggle when I look at my own life to come up with people who have recognized Jesus as Lord because of my response to God's presence in my life. Now you might be saying, well, pastor, uh, you don't understand. God has used you and, and God has spoken through you and, and ministered to me through you and, and you've done this and you've helped people and you've helped me and, and you're trying to take me off the hook. But, but as a pastor, I often have people coming to me searching for Jesus. I have people coming to me that it's, it's almost like cherry picking, right? Like it's, it's, this is easy. If I'm being real honest and I were to look at my life in 2020, just this past year, and, and kind of look at it, it's, it's been a little while since I've been able to really reach out and get to, to, to share the gospel with someone that's not already coming seeking the gospel. Now, that could be because, you know, COVID and I can't go hang out at coffee shops or restaurants or I'm not at ball games or you're just sitting down and talking to people, you know, went to Disney on ice and there's like people like 40 feet away and you're like, oh, neighbor, you know, and stuff like that where normally I'm just talking to anybody. You know, could that be it? But I refuse to ex- excuse my conviction because it's easy to say, well, this is just weird circumstances. You know, this is just a season of life. Well, well let me tell you, This could be your last season of life. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Let me ask you this question. When was the last time 
your response to the presence of God in your life caused someone to recognize Jesus as Lord? Are you walking around as a saved child of God, but your life is virtually unmoved? Are you even responding to God's presence in your life? Because I believe that when Jesus moves into your neighborhood, when he, when he comes in and he enters your life, there has to be a response. It, 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 it's, it's like a reaction. It's involuntary. It, it, it's, it comes, he comes in and he, he begins to change you. I think there are two main ways that people will recognize Jesus as Lord, and the first has to do with the physical. More specifically, people will recognize Jesus by our demeanor and our actions. Let's talk a little bit about our physical demeanor. In our text, we see John as a baby, excited, leaping for joy, swimming around, kicking, punching, doing leaps in Elizabeth's womb when he encountered the presence of Jesus. Something happened in his spirit that triggered a physical response. Now let me ask you this. When Jesus came in and saved you, did you smile? When you experience the joy of the Lord on a daily basis, do you smile? Let's talk a little bit about smiling, church, right? Give me your best smile right now. Oh, that's good. Oh, you not so much, okay? Um, some good smiles, right? It might be a little bit harder nowadays to smile with masks on, but how many try to make it and be intentional about going around and smiling? You know what a smile does? It opens up a door. It says, hey, I'm approachable. It says, hey, I'm, I'm willing to converse. I'm, I'm willing to be talked to. It says, I'm internally happy. You say, what, what does smiling have to do with anything? How can you not smile with being saved? How can you not smile at what Jesus has done in your life? Yeah, the world is burning up, but guess what? I got Jesus inside me, and I'm okay with it because I know where my future is. And you can have the same joy, and you can smile through all the pain, all the struggles, whatever you're going through in life, in sickness, in, in, in times of, of, of just persecution, I can smile because Jesus is inside me. Your smile is a testimony. It will open up doors for opportunity for people who are like, what's, what's his deal? Why are you smiling? You know, a simple smile at a customer service counter can make all the difference in the service that you receive. Oh, you better believe it. When I go and I return something that I don't have a receipt, I got a big old smile on my face. You know? When God enters our life, there needs to be a physical change. I, I, I know that like I look out during worship and I'm, I'm, I don't have anybody in mind, but some of you guys look like angry elves that need a hug. <laughs> Serious. Like we're here worshiping the Lord. It's like, I raise a hallelujah on the presence of my enemies, you know? You're just like, you, are you serious? Our physical demeanor and what we do physically can point others to Christ. We see it in John, we see it in a smile. You know, there's been times where I've gone to a restaurant and you know you get that server, which again, it's hard to see smiles now with masks, but you get that server that just has a warm, sweet smile and demeanor about them. And I think this person has to be a Christian. And before I invite them to New Hope, I say, hey, do you go to church? And most times those people say, yeah, I go so-and-so. I'm involved, I teach Sunday school, I do this or I do that. What does your demeanor, ask yourself, what does your demeanor say about your relationship with God? Do people see Christ in the joy and the life that Christ has given you through your demeanor. You know, not only just in our physical demeanor, but I believe that in, in our physical actions, they speak of what God has done in our life. John spent his adult life physically baptizing people and pointing them to Christ. And if you have an abled body, you need to be using that abled body to glorify God. You know, we've got a lot of elderly people in our church, and just this week, Pastor Jeff, able body, he's helping Barb Kelderman as she's moving into a different season of life. He, he went and he took the church trailer out of his day, and he went and he moved all of, of her stuff. Physical, abled man, and he's doing that. 
there should be more Pastor Jeffs. If, if you're able to use your body to serve the Lord and to bring glory to him through that, do that. If you see someone with a change in a tire out in the cold and you feel prompted in your spirit, hey, you need to stop and do that, do that. Why? Because they're going to say, hey, thank you so much. Hey, no problem. Let me tell you about Jesus. This is the only reason why I stopped because quite honestly, my fingers hurt and I didn't want to do this, but Jesus told me to do this. And you get an opportunity to share Jesus. If God reveals a need to you and you see a need, could it be that he has opened up your eyes to see that need because he wants you to do something about it? If you come to me and say, hey, we've got this need at church, do something about it, I'm gonna say, how about you do something about it because you're the one who saw it and you were the one that was quickened by the Spirit to see it. Our physical actions matter, and I think this church does a great job at physically demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ. Just this week, with your guys' financial help, over 150 stockings were filled for kids who live in the inner city and delivered by our youth group. Just this week, over 21, or I think 21 people uh, gave from New Hope, 50 to $100 to buy Christmas presents for people who are in a rehab program called Teen Challenge. And these adults and these parents who are trying to get their life back on track were able to go Christmas shopping and wrap their gifts and give their kids a Christmas present because of you guys. Later today, Doug and Marsha Roofer, they're gonna be here in the 11 o'clock. They're delivering 126 meals to a predominantly Hispanic community and, and giving that out as a ministry. That's amazing. I commend you guys for being being a church that, that people can physically see God through us and in us. This whole church is cleaned by volunteers. The sidewalks by volunteers. The lawn, the garden. There are so many opportunities to serve. So I commend you guys. You know, the, the, the words and, and the saying, you know, uh, actions speak louder than words, they don't come from nowhere. Jesus says, they will know you by your fruit. In other words, they will know you by your actions. Ask yourself, do your actions reflect God's presence in your life? Would people be able to tell without a shadow of a doubt that you are a Christian by what you do, by the way that you look? John physically leapt and then he physically baptized people and directed people to Jesus. But more than just what he did, John also used his words. Let's jump over to the book of John. And uh, we're going to read John 1, verses 29 through 37. And this is just about uh, Jesus coming up to John the Baptist and John the Baptist, what he does, what he says. Verse 29, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave his, this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain on, uh, and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen Son. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. People will recognize Jesus by our words. Let's pause a second and just imagine. Would Andrew and Peter have gotten up, left John, and followed Jesus if John the Baptist would have just remained silent? If John the Baptist would have never said, look, there's the Lamb of God. Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Would Andrew have ever got up and left and followed Jesus? I don't think so. Did you know that there are people that are so close to accepting Jesus as Lord, but they have yet to hear? They have yet to know. There are people, we have people come into our church that are past their halfway point at life. You know, they're, they're above 50, they're above 60, and they have never had an accurate representation of the gospel. They don't know that Jesus died for their, their sins. They don't know that God loves them. And we've had people, maybe that's you, and you came to New Hope, and you're like, I, I had no idea. At one point, you know, in, in one sense, 
I love that. I love the fact that people can come to New Hope and they can hear the full gospel. They can hear the truth. They can hear an uncompromised gospel of what's going on. I'm, I'm glad of that. The other part, it burdens me and it saddens me because I think here's these people that are past um, you know, the halfway point at life, coming into our church, never hearing about Jesus. And I have to wonder, how many Christians have they brushed shoulders with and they've kept their mouth shut? How many missed opportunities were there for this person to hear about Jesus? And then if they would have accepted Jesus at 30, they could have done all this good for the kingdom of God these last 20 years. It it burdens me. How is your neighbor supposed to hear about Christ if all you are is a good neighbor to them? Listen, swinging a hammer for your neighbor is a good thing, but it needs to be coupled with words. And we see that with John's ministry. He physically is doing all this stuff, but his words back his walk. And then we trust the Holy Spirit that quickens that and allows people to recognize Jesus as Lord. Sometime this next year, you're going to hear Pastor Kerry talk about a neighborhood prayer initiative. And, and the idea is very simple. It's just that we go into our neighborhoods. We ask our neighbors, are, is there anything that I can be praying for you? And then you write those prayer requests down and you pray for them. You bring them back to the church and there'll be people that will be praying with you for your neighbors. And then in a couple weeks, you are pastoring your neighbors and you go back to them and say, hey, um, a couple weeks ago you told me about this. How is that going? How, how, how are things going in your life? How's this prayer request? Do you have any new prayer requests? And, and the idea is, is simple, that God wants to reveal himself to all mankind. And I believe that God wants your neighborhood to start experiencing answered prayers through you. How cool would it be if your neighbor got healed of cancer and he never once prayed to, to Jesus, but he knew that you were praying? Do you think that would be a testimony of what's going on? Some of you are thinking, no way, I'm not doing that. That is so uncomfortable. I hardly talk to my neighbors. When I walk the dog, I pull out my phone and do the fake thing. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to, to go to my neighbors. That, that's going to make me feel really awkward or it's just uncomfortable for me. You know what's going to be way more uncomfortable than talking to someone that you might not know well? is standing before Christ and having to come up with a valid excuse as to why you kept your mouth shut when he wanted you to go to your neighbor. That's some truth. That terrifies me. Just this past week, there was a girl in Urbandale that was murdered. I graduated high school with her. She's one of the funniest, most kind, light up the room type of people at Urbandale High School. Every time she would see me, she would start singing Dreamweaver. You know, she's just, she's funny. And I had this thought as I was preparing this sermon, when I get to heaven, am I going to have Christ ask me, Austin, why did you never share your faith with Mary in high school? Now, we weren't necessarily friends. We shared some classes. We were cordial. I enjoyed her, but that's a serious question. Now, I don't know where Mary's at, I have to trust in Jesus. I pray that she encountered him in some way and accepted him as Lord and Savior. I need to pray for her her baby boy, two years old, no longer with a mother and now no longer with a father as he's likely going to be in prison. That's a shame. But it's also a shame that people would get to age 88, 89, 90, 95, and never hear about Jesus Christ. John accepted his role as preparing a way for the Messiah. Have you accepted your role? Does your demeanor, do your physical actions, do your words all align so that others might know? Allow God to speak to you as you ask yourself this question, which neighbors in my life need an introduction? Who needs an introduction that you know? I believe that the appropriate response to Jesus entering your neighborhood is to introduce him to your neighbors. 
So who do you know that could use some Jesus in their life? We have four Christmas Eve services coming up. This is where it gets practical. This is where it gets easy. This, this is where the rubber meets the road. Technically, we have six Christmas Eve services because we've got a couple mask-on-only services happening simultaneously, right? Maybe you need to text your neighbor and say, hey, I'm attending the Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Christmas Eve service. Would you and your family join me at my church this Christmas Eve? You know that most people go to church on Christmas Eve and most people go to church at Easter. Why not take them to a church that presents the full gospel? Why not present them to a church that's relational? Why not take them to a savior who can save them? An introduction needs to take place. Maybe that resonated in your heart and that spoke to your heart and you're like, man, I need to do that. Pull out your phone right now. Don't let God's spirit prompting like pass you out, like pass by, excuse me, not pass you out, pass by. Text, text your neighbor right now, maybe. Maybe you need to text them this week and say, hey, how can I be praying for you? I've got a really good relationship with one of my neighbors. He lost his father this year. We've shed some tears together. I believe he knows the Lord. The other neighbor, I've lived in my house six and a half years. He could use a lot of Jesus. His lifestyle is very different than the lifestyle Elizabeth and I choose to live. I'm ashamed to say that in the six and a half years that I've lived in my house, I haven't introduced Jesus to him. I've invited him to church a handful of times, but I've never even had him over to our house for a meal. We've talked about it. We say, oh yeah, we need to get together. Yeah, we need to get together. Well, what's my problem? I was convicted in, in preparing this sermon. How can I preach a sermon instructing you guys to go out to your neighbors at If it's been six and a half years and I've got a neighbor that I know doesn't know the Lord, needing an introduction. Who is it that God is speaking to you in your heart? The harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. If that was true then, how much more truer is it today? Would you stand with me this morning? This is the perfect year to to introduce people to Jesus. 2020, the worst year ever. I talk to people and they say, oh man, it's just been dark. I've been so depressed. I've been so anxious. I, I just feel like there's this weight over me. If that's not a perfect opportunity to introduce them to the light of the world, Jesus Christ, I don't know what is. People, we get sad about the end of America and you know, all these different things. And yeah, our our world right now is kind of going up in, in, in flames. Yes, things are getting worse. Yes, it's a shame. Yes, your comfortable American life might get less comfortable in the coming years. But you know what that means? It means that God's light can shine brighter. It means that our smiles will stand out even more. It excites me, it legitimately excites me. Call me crazy, but it excites me for the times that we're entering. Because I believe that there's gonna be an outpouring of God's spirit in this place. And he wants you to be a part of it. Close your eyes across this room. I wanna give opportunity to anyone here who has not experienced Jesus coming into their neighborhood, coming into their life, and it's like, wow, that peace, that joy, that strength, that wisdom, that love that you talk about, I've never experienced that. I've never asked Jesus to come into my life to be Lord of my life. I've never asked to be forgiven of my sins. And if that's you for the very first time, with every eye closed out of respect for your neighbor, I just wanna pray for you. And and would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you this morning? Is there anyone here? If you're watching online and that's you, I 
send me an email, austin at newhope.church. I wanna be able to connect with you. I wanna be able to guide you. And if you said that, would you just repeat this prayer after me? Jesus, enter my life. I make you Lord, I make you King. I trust that your way is the best way. And God, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins, that you'd set my feet on a path of righteousness. And God, I pray that I would receive your peace and your love and your joy and your strength so that I might be a witness of what you're doing in my life right now at this moment. Forgive them and save them in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. We're gonna sing this song, and as we sing this song, the world needs Jesus. I want you to be thinking and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Who needs Jesus that you have influence over? Which one of your neighbors, and how are you gonna do that? So let's sing this song. God, let our lives align with every word that you say. Let our eyes see the hurting and the broken, Lord. And may we be an accurate representation of you. I pray that today we would leave with less of us and more of you. Less of us and more of you. Less of what I want and more of what you want, Jesus. Less about what I need and more about what you need, Jesus. Change my heart. Change my heart. Renew my way of thinking and open my eyes to see things that are unseen, Lord. I pray that you'd begin to drop names in people's hearts right in this very moment of people that are ready for a harvest. People that are ready to step into a relationship with you. A life-giving, life-changing relationship with you. Fill us with your spirit so that we might be able to fulfill what you're asking us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is an important message. And I said this in the early service, it's not a part of my notes, but let's not be comparing our roles to someone else's role. Because the role that you play is every bit as important as the role that I play. Without your role, I wouldn't be able to speak up here to people that need to hear. God bless you as you go 